Thank you, Patricia, and welcome everyone. Um, I'm Terry Hill. I'm the, the Senior Advisor for Rural Health Leadership and Policy for the National Rural Health Resource Center. And over the last 15 years or so, it's been my pleasure to co-host co -host and co-chair this particular coalition uh, with my colleague, Neil Newberger. And we are currently uh, ending uh, our, our program year. And for the last 15 years as well, we have been supported by the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy uh, through our task program here at the center. And so today uh, we have what I think is an extremely important topic. Uh, uh, and that is uh, public health, uh, health information, basically. And uh, a lot has been going on since the pandemic. And we have several speakers here today that I think are going to be extremely interesting. And again, as I said, this is such an uh, important topic. Um, at the end of this program year, as we're concluding it, this is our sixth coalition meeting. And we've also had six uh, telehealth webinars. So it's been a very heavy focus during this particular program year. Um, we are not going to task and, and the center will not be supporting the coalition going forward. Uh, we've you know, just basically put a pretty intense effort this, this past year. And we're just not sure you know, whether the coalition is going to continue or not. But I, I do so want to thank everybody that have participated uh, with, with the coalition and I particularly want to thank the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy for supporting it. I think uh, when we began, uh, you know, we were really in the very embryonic stages of health information technology. Uh, we now have the Office of the National Coordinator uh, who's going to be heard from, their office can be heard from today. We also for, have the, the Office of the Advancement of Telehealth, which has grown substantially, et cetera. So, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to work with those organizations and a big emphasis this year has been on helping support our state flex programs kind of move forward in both of those areas. Um, so with that, uh, I'm going to, uh, first of all, go over the agenda. We're going to have Laura Seaford here uh, from the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy. Jenna Cope is here from the Office for the Advancement of Telehealth. Uh, Neil's going to do his usual update on, on federal initiatives. Uh, we're going to hear from Rachel Abbey, who is with Public Health Infrastructure Modernization from the Office of the National Coordinator for for Health IT, or ONC for short. We're gonna have a report on public health initiative modernization, uh, a state pers perspective uh, from Jesu Hurtado, and that'll pretty much co cover the space that we have available today. So I'm gonna turn, first of all, things over to Laura Seaford from the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy. And she's going to give us kind of an update on what's going on uh, in her office. Laura? Thanks so much, Terry. Um, I'll keep everything short and sweet. We are here on the FLEX program in the federal office. We're about ready to kick off our new FLEX program year starting on what is it, Thursday the 1st? Yeah, my dates are all over the place since we're getting ready for a holiday. Um, yeah, September 1st, we're gonna kick off our new Flex program year. Um, I can tell you the biggest kind of question that most people are wondering on right now and where a lot of our efforts are going is the rural emergency hospital model. So we will have our um, national TA center for the rural emergency hospital model up and funded and off the ground running uh, as of September 30th. So if anyone has questions on this model or what we may need to work on, you can always get in touch with your state office of rural health, have them reach out to us here in the federal office. Uh, we may not have all the answers as the rules are still in the proposed stage right now, but we are trying to answer as many as we can. Um, and if we can't answer the question, then we'll have to kind of wait until September 30th when that TA center kicks off. Um, but that's really kind of a lot of where our effort is going right now on this new model from CMS. And aside from that, I will kick it over to Jenna from the Office for the Advancement for Telehealth for more updates. Jenna? 
Good afternoon, all. I apologize I'm not using my video today, um, but just a few updates from the Office for the Advancement of Telehealth at HRSA. Um, we have our telehealth resource centers. They've been very busy as usual, but it is conference season. Um, we have an upcoming Northwest Regional Telehealth um, Conference September 26th to 28th. The theme is going to be innovation in telehealth. That's going to be in person or virtual. We also have a Northwest Telehealth Resource Center Conference on September 29th to 30th. Uh, and that theme will be exploring the telehealth universe. Uh, we also have an upcoming webinar uh, on the TRC site about reimagining reimbursements. Definitely something um, that is top of mind for many. Uh, we also have a TRC conference, Telehealth Insights, Workforce Policy and Beyond on September 13th to 14th. Um, I will post these in the chat so you can uh, see the dates and everything in one spot. Um, but I also did want to mention that the Office for the Advancement of Telehealth, we just recently in the past few months have launched formal announcements that go out typically about twice a month. So they cover a lot of different topics on the telehealth.hhs.gov site. And they also cover additional research topics that are new releases, um, funding opportunities, as well as a variety of different options. So I'll also put that link if you're interested or know anyone interested in receiving those updates. Um, I will put that link in and it's free to serve and we're hoping more people sign up and get the word out about the announcements. I think that is all I have for today. Thank you, Laura, and thank you, Jenna, as well. I mentioned earlier that uh, during the time the center has staff, the coalition meetings, uh, Neil Newberger has been a constant presence throughout. Um, and it's really my pleasure to announce that uh, the, the center is giving him an award, the Rural Health Information Technology Leadership Award. Uh, kind of in recognition, not just of the years that he has spent uh, co-chairing this coalition meeting, but also from the fact that I know for years, he basically played the lead role. He was the person that was educating Congress through workshops, uh, through just a variety of other educational means on health information and, and, and technology. So I don't know that there's anybody nationally uh, who has do, done as much, at least for rural HIT, as Neil. These are some of the pictures of our coalition over the years. Um, and, um, you know, just, Neil, we are so appreciative of uh, all the work that you have done in this area, not only nationally, because you've made an impact there, but also uh, for our center and for the federal office, et, et cetera, and, and for uh, OAT. Um, so we don't, we can't personally give it to you. I assure you, we have a really nice award <laughs> for you though, Neil. And uh, thanks again so much. And I'm going to turn things over to you so that you can give us your, your update. Well, well, thank you so much to the center and Terry, you've been a Great friend over the years and colleagues. I, colleague, I can't believe how much younger we look and I guess we were in all of those pictures. And um, thanks, that was totally unexpected and I appreciate it. And a shout out to Nicole Clement and to Sally Buck and to Patricia and everybody else at the, at the center and my friends up in Minnesota. And we often trade barbs because I'm from Wisconsin and you know and you got to give it back and forth between the Minnesotans and the Wisconsinites right right um so I appreciate that uh it's been been a lot of fun and a great career and promoting all this and being a fly on the wall watching all of this unhappen on Capitol Hill and within the agencies and in the private sector so again thanks um this is about as timely a topic as I can think of. And Terry and I have been discussing this for, for some time. I mean, you know, what could be more critical right now than public health, infrastructure, 
some of the stove piping that has gone on, the fits and starts, the advances, the you know, given the pandemic and our preparedness and things, Terry and I are both reading a, a book called Premonition, Michael Lewis's book about, you know, kind of the gaffes that have happened in multiple administrations and, you know, just over the years, owing to no one's fault, but just the way it has all evolved. And hopefully, I think we have some brilliant folks on this call who can get into it and discuss, you know, uh, approaches that are being taken. Uh, I first heard our speaker, well, one of our two, our folks from Utah who were heavily involved in some of this had their handle on it, and, uh, and then Anchit, of course. Let me, as I usually do, give you a very quick rundown on policy issues, starting with, you know, and these are the meta issues, privacy and security, uh, lots of ongoing challenges in the telehealth infrastructure world, and the only thing I'll note along that line is that, um, Really, I think it was just today or yesterday, the National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence issued a final project description of what it's calling its mitigating cybersecurity risk in telehealth and smart home integration project that will take place over the next couple of years. And that cybersecurity center is part of NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology, and they're gonna be calling for folks who are interested in a federal register notice to submit themselves uh, through various letters of interest and that kind of thing uh, to serve on, on some of the things that they're gonna be setting up in terms of it. Couldn't be more timely. Uh, telehealth Medicare device coverage, uh, Representative Cheney has legislation to remove geographic originating site restrictions permanently, and that has been amended uh, to extend the geographic and originating site statutory waivers until December 31st of 2024, if the public health emergency ends at the end of this year uh, by an, ex an, an extra two years, instead of just 151 days, it's had some other amendments and things, but basically it's gone through the house and is uh, on July 27th on a 416 to 12 vote, though there is a unanimous uh, uh, vote if you ever saw one. And now it's up to the Senate to decide uh, what to do with that. But I think a lot of folks are, you know, waiting to see if the pandemic coverage of telehealth and remote monitoring is going to continue unabated as it has been. The next issue down the list is health equity access, which is, of course, a huge issue for the department under the guidance of the Biden administration in almost everything they do. And the only thing I'll mention is uh, that just recently, C, uh, C, C, um, Office for the Advancement of or HRSA announced $90 million to health centers to boost health equity vis-a-vis -vis data modernization to enhance care in underserved communities through improved data strategies. And so, you know, there's 90 million bucks to community health centers. Um, uh, folks on this call might want to talk about what else may or should be happening in terms of, you know, the, the rest of that whole constituency that we're always so interested in, but that's interesting and exciting news. The fourth thing I, I'd mention um, is broadband and infrastructure build out. And I just want to draw your attention to a story that was yesterday in the Washington Post. I don't know if you can see this, my screensaver. It's called Amazon Care Ends in Clash of Cultures. Health services early tension show limits of fast frugal approach. And basically what it goes to is the whole issue of how it is that large private sector organizations like Amazon, Apple, Google, and others are going to continue in this space and continue to promote and extend services into especially rural and underserved areas and what the dynamic is going to be. And without saying there's no good, bad or otherwise, but there is a discussion that will likely take place over time having to do with big internet and broadband providers and their role in providing services vis-a-vis -vis, say rural healthcare organizations, critical access hospitals and clinics and the rest. And going forward, that's a great interest. I know of mine and Terry and I have talked about that a little bit also and something that I know I'm gonna be pursuing in any case. Um, next slide, please. 
So to the to the topic, there was an interesting report, if you didn't see it, by one of my older organizations, HIMSS, that was issued on May 22nd. And HIMSS came out with a really good report about modernizing funding for health IT and technology infrastructure towards public health and made recommendations about digitizing across the public health infrastructure, standardizing support and supporting greater interoperability, innovating in terms of how funding goes to state and local health departments in terms of issues like meaningful use and preparedness and health equity, um, how, how to prioritize to uh, electronic case reporting and contract tracing and syndromic surveillance and vital records keeping and laboratory results and immunization registries and, uh, and, and more. And they're they were recommending at the time $36.5 billion for this whole thing. Well, lo and behold, May 2022, the American Rescue Plan gets passed and enacted into law. And that includes $7 billion, $7 billion with a B, to hire and train public health workers and to address infrastructure issues, including $4.4 billion to states and $3 billion to CDC. So. As a result, in June, CDC, Centers for Disease Control, issued a notice of, of funding opportunity around strengthening the US public health infrastructure, the workforce, and data systems to the tune of about $4 billion to states and locals for infrastructure and workforce. So that's a significant chunk of change. And we're gonna to wanna to follow how that all unfolds. And finally, along the lines of CDC, let me just mention that six days ago, as you all would have seen you know, in national news, uh, Dr. Walensky released a report that has to do with revamping about how much of CDC is organized in terms of how it communicates data, how it messages, the timeliness of data, and it's gonna go right to this issue that we're discussing here today. And interestingly enough to Terry and Nicole and me and others, uh, a very familiar face is gonna be in charge of taking that forward. And that's Dr. Mary Wakefield, obviously of HRSA and near and dear to our hearts and you know, close to all of us in rural health. So I think the challenge is you know, what we're gonna to wanna to do is just be in touch with Mary over time as that unfolds. And for some of you all, if you're interested to step up and offer uh, advice and you know, sitting on various committees and things like that. And so with that, I will uh, uh, leave the stage as Elvis would say, and uh, turn it back over to Terry to introduce our first speakers. And again, thanks to National Center for Health, uh, to, to the, to the Re Resource Center in Minnesota and for your friendship, Terry. Thanks. Terry, you're muted. Terry, I think you're on mute. Oh, okay. Uh, thanks. I, I Thank you, Neil. Uh, I also wanted to express my enthusiasm for the addition of Mary Wakefield uh, to the CDC. Uh, she has been a longtime champion of rural health, uh, just a, a brilliant lady. And I'm just so pleased that uh, she's going to add her expertise to this huge challenge that we face, kind of moving for her forward here with the pandemic, et cetera. So let me introduce our, our uh, I guess, our second speaker after, after Neil. Uh, Rachel Abbey is a public health analyst with the HHS Office of the National Coordinator of HIT. She's with the ONC's Office of Policy and supports ONC's public health, its emergency preparedness, EMS, and health information exchange and activity. So she's the right person to be here to topic, talk about this topic. And I'm now gonna turn things over to her. Thank you, Rachel. Great, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And thanks for the opportunity to talk to you all today. I'm um, very excited. Um, I actually, rural health is very uh, near and dear to my heart. 
I worked uh, a few years in the Three Rivers Health District in Virginia, so I know of the unique challenges that face rural communities and as it specifically relates to public health and healthcare. So I'm very excited to be here today. So uh, next slide, I just wanted to just kind of review with you all what I'm gonna talk about today. So first, just kind of introduce ONC. Many of you may not be familiar with the Office of National Coordinator for Health IT. And then I'll talk about the current state of public health data systems, kind of um, what we know and what we're still learning. Um, and then um, talk about several efforts um, that ONC is working in collaboration with CDC on. Um, th that would include US CDI or US CDI Plus, and I promise I'll go over the acronyms <laughs> as we move through the slide deck. Um, talk about some of the um, initiatives around the FAST Healthcare Interoperability Resources uh, Standard. Um, some of you may be familiar with some of these initiatives. And then TAFCA around the trust exchange framework and common agreement. And then lastly, um, I hope to talk about, you know, how how to, how you all can participate, how you can learn and get more involved in some of these efforts moving forward. So uh, next slide. Great, thank you. Um, so just to introduce you, this is, um, I'm with the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT. We were founded back in 2004 by executive order and then later on established in um, statute in 2009. Most of you may be familiar with us as it relates to um, some of the high tech funding that was um, given back in 2009. Our basic charge was to help the healthcare industry become um, more uh, sufficient in regards to electronic um, health records, and so to get um, to get access to electronic health records as well as to get up uh, onto electronic health records, or in other words, to adopt electronic health records. Um, and so with that, um, you know, there was a lot of money spent on that during that time. Also. Um, some of you may be familiar with the CMS uh, Meaningful Use, they're now called the Promoting Interoperability Program at that time, um, came into play as well to help move uh, the industry forward. Um, there were two kinds of paths that we helped to support. One was the adoption of EHRs and then also to uh, facilitate the exchange of data across these systems and helping them to make to become more interoperable. Um, today, we're pivoting uh, into the 21st century, as, as the name alludes to in regards to the 21st Century Cures Act uh, that was passed in 2016. And um, we're looking at uh, some different things around EHRs, um, particularly around information blocking, um, increasing standards, and then also to build that kind of uh, nationwide uh, infrastructure as it relates to the trust exchange framework and common agreement. And I'll talk a little bit more about that um, as we move forward. So next slide, please. So I did wanna share, you know, it, it's been very difficult to kind of really capture the current state of what public health agencies and public health data systems are currently as it relates to health IT or IT in general. Um, and so I did wanna share just some brief bullet points here. And this came out of CDC's uh, preliminary findings on the current status from their data modernization initiative, the assessment that they did recently um, with states and locals. And so as you can see, you know, States and locals are still continuing to, to kind of progress forward. They're in the process of identifying specific uh, systems or applications for modernization. They're looking at um, legacy and those siloed systems as um, folks were um, spoke about before. Um, you know, they, they also are continuing to just look at um, you know, new cloud services or open source applications. Um, and 
also looking at ways to enhance their data and their data quality. Um, they're also beginning to look at data governance, how and who can have access to um, the information that public health agencies house. Also, um, the process of implementing, you know, IT government pro governance pro policies as well. Um, and then looking at newer technologies such as um, APIs and, and, and API management, how that, what that looks like, things like that. So they're still, um, you know, they're moving, they're progressing towards, um, towards a more uh, better systems and, and things like that, but there's still a, a long way to go. So next slide, please. So I did want to just briefly talk about that there's been some, you know, very heroic efforts have been made, but ongoing challenges, you know, still persist um, in achieving interoperability in particular. You know, we're looking at manual work. Um, there continues to be still some pieces that need to be, not everything is all electronic. Not everything can be shared across systems. Data continues to be very messy. I mean, um, EHR data, it, it's still not um, of great quality in some places. Um, it's, still, it's still very messy and there needs to be a lot of cleanup in, on the public health side in regards to when they receive that data. Um, data can be uh, out of date very quickly as well, um, as you all know. Um, timing is very, very important. And then, um, you know, it, it's hard to turn to alternatives. So they're trying to look at where else they can get the information uh, to pass on to public health. You know, and then and just to also say that there's also some additional barriers, you know, moving forward. You know, um, there is the constant, consistent funding for public health data systems. Where is that coming from? Um, often the federal government funds uh, public health agencies more in silos. So it's for specific programs and very specific program based. It's not, um, not for general use or how that locality um, would like to uh, improve their data systems. Um, there hasn't been in the past, you know, real priority either at the federal level or even at the state and local level to invest in um, their IT systems and, and their data information systems. Um, and then information technology is complicated, as you all know, at the state and local level. Often it's um, structured government-wide and um, public health isn't often a priority. There are other priorities within um, local governments um, versus for public health. Um, another thing we were hearing is that contracting also um, is a great impediment in regards to uh, getting um, new and innovative technologies and systems. Um, and then lastly, um, as our as Neil talked about just previously, you know, there's a huge gap in regards to knowledge and staff development and also like um, staff turnover right now is really huge, particularly in um, public health, uh, just from the COVID burnout. And so there's a huge um, need to build that knowledge back around public health informatics. So next slide, please. I did want to say that, you know, our goal here is to really begin moving from this like current state where data use agreements are negotiated one at a time, where data is sent multiple times in multiple formats to multiple places, and, um, and that public health needs are well understood and well vocalized. So the idea is that many of these efforts that I'll begin talking about will hopefully begin moving public health in that right direction um, so that uh, things will get you know, we'll have faster access to data, um, you know, common agreements will be across the board and that uh, public health uh, needs are valued and prioritized. So next slide, please. 
So over the past two years, ONC has been actively partnering with CDC and other public health partners um, to work together to improve data systems and help bring public health into the 21st century. And so really looking at the new data standards and policies and trying to transform um, digital health data and make it more as a cohesive unit versus all of these different efforts working, not working in tan tandem together. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna talk first about the um, ONC's effort around uh, US core data for interoperability. Next slide, please. So uh, US CDI, which is what we call the US core data for interoperability, it's really a common core of standardized data to support treatment, payment, healthcare operations, requests from patients, post-market surveillance, research, public health, and other authorized uses. So it cuts across many of these different use cases, but it's a core set of data that is, um, you know, that will be required by the end of this year for all data systems, uh, healthcare data systems to share across the board. So next slide, please. Great, uh, so this is currently uh, the US CDI version one, and this has all of the current initial uh, data elements that will be required by the end of this calendar year. And so um, ONC is it's a standard minimum data set required for interoperability. So it's agnostic, um, it doesn't need like special technology, things like that. And it really require it really defines the required data elements in the vocabulary standards. Um, it's updated on an annual cycle with federal agency and industry input. You know, we continue to update this. We're already um, on version three, which I'll show you in just a second. Um, and so, um, you know, we're continuing to press the envelope to move this forward. And so um, as this gets integrated more into the, the work streams and things like that of the healthcare systems, we think it will um, become more of the norm. So next slide, please. So as you can hear, as you can see, this is our uh, USCDI version three. And in comparison, there's very, um, there's some specific areas I wanted to kind of point out, and those are circled in red here. Um, and, and these are the places where public health really had an impact, um, you know, particularly around the need for pregnancy status and um, disability status, for example, also around the need to capture like race and ethnicity, tribal affiliation, those things, um, sexual orientation, those things that they need in order to do their job better and more efficiently. And lastly, just um, to point out some occupational, you know, it, it, occupational, <laughs> occupation. Um, so what you do during your day, day is really important, particularly in some of the environmental health um, impacts and things like that. So next slide, please. So as you can see here, uh, USCDI continues to evolve. This evolve. This is our timeline currently. We are. We just completed uh, the final US CDI version three. So we'll be moving into uh, the draft process as we begin looking at version four moving forward. So um, I I really encourage those of you who are interested in providing some input into this process. It's very simple, it's very active. Um, you can continue to provide input. Um, and, and it's really important that we hear from a diverse group of people, even across settings. I mean, I know that there, are there may be specific data elements that are very pertinent to rural health. And so it would be important to make sure that that is noted um, in this process. So next slide, please. Just earlier uh, this year, we announced um, USCDI Plus for public health. 
we are working very actively with our uh, state and local partners as well as CDC and trying to capture um, additional data elements that are very specific um, to public health. Things like um, the initial date of onset of symptoms. That may not be pertinent across all healthcare systems, but it's very pertinent to uh, the epidemiological investigation um, that takes place at, at local and state health departments. So this is why um, we decided to uh, create various uh, additional um, data elements that we are calling USCVI Plus. There's other um, efforts uh, going in parallel as well. There's one for, for payment, I think, and quality measures. Um, but public health is actually first out the door because the administration felt like it was such an important thing that we need to begin to tackle. So next slide, please. This is just a screenshot of um, our process through USCDI Plus, where you can provide input and, and provide some comments on this. Um, and I encourage you all to, to get involved. We're happy to allow you access. It's, um, it's by, by name and password only, but, but it's so easy for us to grant you access. And I'll talk more later at the end about how you can get access so that you can see those additional data elements moving forward. Next slide, please. Great, I'm just gonna talk about a few efforts that we have underway um, as it relates to the FAST Healthcare Interoperability Resources, that's FIRE, um, which is a, a new, fairly new innovative um, standard, data standard uh, moving forward. And so uh, next slide. I know many of you may not be familiar with FIRE, um, but it's a, a core, uh, new and innovative data standard that allows access and sharing of health information like see more seamlessly across different systems. Um, it's a set of best practices and open standards being developed and adopted by a global community uh, to make data sharing more flexible and effective. Um, we've seen it uh, being widely adopted in healthcare and so now we're trying to uh, push it more forward in the public health space. So next slide. As, you, as I mentioned, um, so part of the 21st Century uh, Standard Cures Act is that um, we are requiring um, fire APIs um, without special effort at the end of this year. Um, it requires the availability of APIs that can be accessed without special effort. Um, and so by December 31st, 2022, all certified uh, technology developers, um, those are the ones that ONC certifies through um, their certification program, required to deploy a standard FHIR API across their entire customer base. So this will allow easier access to information, specifically those uh, USCDI data um, elements and classes within uh, the version one. So that's, that's the launching pad that we're using um, come the end of this year. So next slide, please. I did wanna mention that there is also a public health fire implementation collaborative um, and this is really led by CDC and it's building on um, sort of a public um, health fire community and helping to identify key challenges, implement um, fire-based solutions, and then provide training and technical assistance moving forward. Uh, next slide, please. So these are the three areas of focus that they are looking at. Um, they're looking at establishing uh, this uh, public health fire implementation collaborative um, steering committee. They're partnering with a few states and local pilot sites to identify small but key, key opportunities for fire-based solutions. 
And then lastly, they're building on the fire capacity across STLTs in, learn in a learning community through activities such as workshops, um, office hours, and publishing a playbook. I really, this is a really great way um, for you all to learn just about fire. And um, they are so patient, the folks that run these um, weekly office hours. So if you just even want to you know, call in and just learn more about fire, what it might benefit you or not benefit you. Um, you know, they've been great. They've asked like very basic questions to the very, very complex questions. So I think it's a great learning opportunity for folks um, to begin just kind of getting their feet wet and learning more about um, this this effort and as well as other efforts moving forward. So next slide, please. So the other effort I wanted to focus in on on fire is Helios. We launched earlier this year in collaboration with CDC and our other public health partners, um, what we're calling Helios, which is a fire accelerator project and it's um, really uh, in partnership with HL7, and, and it's very similar to um, some of the other fire accelerator projects that they're leading. And it's helping to public, helping public health align with and benefit from widespread <clears throat> standardization and transformation that are happening at, around the digital health data. So, you know, it's, it's a multi-sector alliance. There are many folks from many different places involved. Um, again, as I mentioned, it's an official HL7 fire accelerator, and it's really going to be focused on the impact. It's really going to look at, okay, what works, what doesn't, as it relates to fire and public health. Um, so, I encourage those of you who are interested in that to also uh, look into this, and I'll talk how you can join that in the end as well. So uh, next slide, uh, just to, they have three focus areas that they're looking at. First off is making data and public health systems accessible in bulk. And that's really, it looks like they're narrowing their focus in um, specifically on immunization information systems and really looking at some of the various use cases where they may need a whole lot of information on um, various patients as it relates to their current uh, immunization status. Um, the second one is around align and optimize public health data sharing. That's really looking at different ways to um, access data, whether that's querying for data, whether that's pushing data um, as it is today in regards to public health reporting. It's mostly pushing the data to public health, or um, maybe it's a combination. Um, and so looking at those, those different pathways um, that public health uh, can use in regards to um, accessing, and then also looking at how public health can better share data as well. So we're, and then the third one is delivering aggregate information to public health. So this is really looking at um, various different methods of getting access to data, particularly during a public health emergency. Um, we had many issues um, as it relates to trying to get uh, timely uh, data, particularly around healthcare operations. Uh, HR issues as to like staffing and, and bed capacity. How, how are we able to get that information easier and quicker? So um, that's, that's the charge of that work group, um, looking at that as well. So next slide, please. Lastly, I'm going to talk about the Trusted Exchange Framework and Common Agreement. That's what we call TAPCA. Next slide. So this is um, also part of our charge as part of 21st Century Cures Act. And we are working to develop or support a trust exchange framework for trust policies and practices and for a common agreement for exchange across all of these different health networks. So next slide, please. 
Some of you may be uh, familiar with health information exchanges, and you know that there are various different networks. And so what TEFCA hopes to do in the future is to connect all of these uh, networks, kind of think of them as like inter the interstate highway. That's what we're building is the interstate highway to connect all of these state kind of highways so that everyone can have access to all of this information together and hopefully building on single on ramps so that if you're a member of one health information um, network, you can then have access to the same data across all of these different networks so that it's, it's breaking down those silos of data moving forward. So next slide, please. Great, and this is just the timeline um, where we are in regards to uh, TEFCA. We are, uh, one of the exchange purposes of TEFCA is, is public health. And so we will be working over the next couple of months to begin um, establishing a standard operating procedure uh, for that public health data exchange and what that looks like all of that still being worked out, um, but hopefully that will begin very soon. And we hope to um, have something within the first of the year to, uh, to work towards building that forward. Okay, next slide, please. Lastly, I just did, I wanted to touch upon this. This was um, a blog that we posted back in the beginning of August um, that we, are now working greater, uh, greater across HHS and collaborating, collaborating across all of our different programs within federal HHS um, to align better on our policies as it relates to health IT activities. And as you can see, we called out specifically here on the side that we're working to incorporate like standards of health IT requirements and language in all applicable um, HHS funding programs, contracts, and policies. So hopefully in the future, we're better aligned at the federal level as it relates to interoperability, right? And everyone is using and, and pushing towards um, the same kinds of standards. And so that there's less, it's less of this silo of data moving forward. So next slide. So as I said, this is um, a great slide and, and um, from what I understand, you all will have um, access to these slides, but um, just to you know, highlight, um, if you're interested in USCDI Plus for public health, this is how, these are some uh, resources as well as some contacts in regards to being able to be a part of that active engagement process. Um, we really encourage you to, to at least gain access to see what those data elements and classes are and to see if there are additional ones that are very specific to um, what you all work on. And then um, public health and fire, we talked about Helios, we talked about the um, public health fire implementation collaborative, um, and this this talks about how you can participate in both of these types of events, and I encourage you um, to check those out as well. And then lastly, about TEFCA, we, ONC, work very closely with um, the recognized coordinating entity, which is the body that's really organizing TEFCA. And so they have put out some great resources and also hold monthly uh, regular public meetings. Um, so we encourage you to also um, participate in those as well. So next slide, please. And I think that's it. Yes. And I'm happy to take any questions or any, any sort of points, anything <laughs> you all might have at this time. So thank you all very much. Really great, Rachel. And any questions from anybody? We have a few minutes here if you care to ask them. I realize it's a lot to digest and I apologize, but 
I, I think you have an enormous amount on your plate for ONC. And I think the enormity of the problem itself, uh, I feel better knowing that, that there's, there are initiatives going on to address this, this issue. Neil, anything, any question that you, you would have? No, Terry, I thought that was, was really comprehensive. Uh, and uh, Rachel, give our best to Steve and to Mickey and, um, and, and the rest of the crew there. And you guys are doing great. I also Absolutely. like the fact that, that, that you're welcoming input. So folks take, take, you know, a lot of our folks on this call come from departments of health with their federal office of rural health. And so I, I do encourage you as well to reach out and provide input in this uh, incredibly important issue. Such. So I'm gonna turn things over to Nicole Clement, who is going to introduce our next speaker. Sure, thanks, Terry. So um, our next speaker is going to provide a state perspective on public health infrastructure modernization. So. Um, Jesus Hurtado is a health informaticist with the Utah Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, he's part of the team that is the Utah Statewide Immunization Information System, or USIIS. He completed his undergraduate degree in biology at BYU-Idaho and is currently pursuing a master's in biomedical informatics at the University of Utah. He grew up in Meridian, Idaho for most of his life and has lived in the Salt Lake area for the last four years. So, uh, Jesus, I will turn it over to you to tell us what's going on in Utah. Thank you, Nicole. Um, can you all hear me very yep, well? Yep, you sound great. Okay, awesome. Um, let me share my screen. Let me know if it pops up. Okay. Okay, well, thank you for the um, presentation so far. Everything's been said. Um, thank you for the introduction, and um, I'll, I'll just jump into it. Um, the the one the first thing we want to talk about is just kind of uh, get everyone up to speed on data modernization, what it is, um, why it's important. Later on, we'll talk a little bit about um, why or what it is that we're doing uh, in Utah, uh, specifically with USIS, um, and then talk a little bit about rural health. Um, as we talked with that department and they give us some information about what's going on with them. Um, but just to give uh, a uh, update on what DMI is, it's an uh, initiative promoted by the CDC. Um, essentially, it's an effort to promote technical, technological infrastructure. Um, and not only that, but also put the right people, the right policies and the right processes in place to help us prevent any um, future problems that may come up uh, before they happen, and then reduce any of that harm that ca happens if they do happen. Um, and obviously, so like the question is why? Why is DMI import important? Why is this modernization important? Um, well, for one, it can create that uh, infrastructure, that inter interoperability um, between different health structures, and let them share that data, um, communicate seamlessly. Um, it obviously will help advance. Um, that the, advance them so they can share that information that's been stored um, and reducing those data silos. Um, and in effect, will help with uh, just sending that information in a timely manner and in a more complete manner because um, it will provide any essential data about demographics that may help um, providers, um, entire um, hospitals, um, areas, and benefit the community in a sense. Um, we and we want to go from a reactive model to a prescriptive model um, when it comes to this this information. Um, but when I say reactive, prescriptive, um, reactive is that sort of information that we will react to. We get this information, so what should we do now that we know this? What should we do um, when we've gained this data about these uh, the subgroup or this um, community? And we want to go from that to a point where we can take the data that's coming in and say, oh, we're seeing this trend or we're seeing um, this data popping up. What are we going to do so that we can prevent X from happening? Like if we're seeing 
for example, if we're seeing um, pockets of um, of a certain virus or a certain um, just uh, sicknesses popping up maybe in a select area. And if we're noticing that, if we can find out what's happening, find out the why, then perhaps we can prevent any anything that we have to react to. So that's what we're going for with DMI. Um, in essence, it will essentially help us see early and quickly uh, what solutions we can you know, implement. Um, it'll help identify, for example, and understand what our, where, what our investments are producing. So if we're putting in this much effort in perhaps, say, developing the skills of our workforce, um, what sort of product is that giving us? You know, where um, is this taking us down where we want? If we're implementing some new kind of program, will that give us the results that we're looking for? Um, so one thing that perhaps that we see a lot of is uh, people will go to a clinic and they will receive preventative treatments such as flu shots, uh, colonoscopies. This sort of thing will help the community in essence. Um, but a lot of times that information isn't being um, shared in a way that will help us um, in the way we want. Um, one thing that uh, that this this uh, picture comes from is a, from a paper that uh, talks about the three buckets of prevention. Um, when a, the example they give in there was that if we can introduce some sort of innovative clinical prevention, um, then it would benefit the community um, as a whole. The example they give is um, a lot of times in clinics, we the doctors and nurses see something, but since there's no communication as um, amongst other clinics, perhaps one group of people that are experiencing the same thing will go to, to one clinic, go to a different clinic, and, um, and that communication is, isn't shared. In New Jersey, um, they did something a little bit differently where they kind of went outside the clinic, reached out to the community, um, and they noticed that there was an, a, two groups of apartment buildings that were experiencing these asthmatic symptoms or asthmatic attacks. Um, and because they did that, they were able to target um, these apartment buildings and give them a sort of education on how to better their, their environment. And therefore, we're able to prevent any, any more issues and in essence, in essence, helping the community. So we want to reach that where we're, um, we're sort of promoting some more uh, innovative clinical prevention and uh, promoting that community health. So what are some of these barriers to DMI? Like what are the things that are preventing us from reaching these goals that we have or these, uh, uh, this, uh, this state of being that we want? Um, one of those things is programmatic siloed funding. Um, the way that some of the programs are set up, a lot of times they don't have in mind to set up uh, avenues for data sharing. Um, I know in uh, some of our departments, a lot of times we just want the things that will work that will benefit us the moments what we need, but won't have in mind of like, eventually we may need to share this with other departments or other states, and therefore those avenues are never created. Um, funding in itself is also sometimes short term and low. Um, a lot of times it's really just a mentality of here and now, and we don't know if those projects will be sustainable after that funding ends. We don't really set that up. Um, another thing that is, uh, keeps us from achieving it is an adequately trained workforce. Uh, when the people who are managing these programs or these silos or these um, information systems don't have the, the abilities and skills, then therefore the whole system lacks and we can't get the information that we need. Um, data solids obviously don't help us share the information. Uh, data sharing and data linkage challenges a lot of times doesn't give us that opportunity to share that information. And then something that happens uh, a lot of times in different places, there's just distrust uh, amongst people in sharing data. Um, a lot of times they do, wouldn't like to uh, give others, their other people, other entities, that information about themselves or the people that they serve. Um, and then another thing is that laws and regulations um, tend to 
in some cases, some states don't give that opportunity for entities or organizations to give information out to perhaps other states or other organizations. So what are some of the things that we can do um, so we can implement DMI? Well, for one, we can address the current date data gaps and access challenges. Um, therefore, those public health professionals can get that data to need. Um, and we need to, I mean, challenge. We need to challenge them and um, look for ways to, to overcome them. Another thing that we can do to implement that, uh, to implement DMI, is exploring new types of data. So, uh, for example, we have a list of hospital ambulatory care records, health insurance claims, EHRs. Um, one example that I can give is um, if we have uh, the falling data from EMTs that go visit uh, more of the elderly, if we can perhaps one patient can be seen that has been falling a lot more lately. Um, when he gets to the doctor, if the doctor can see that information, perhaps he will prescribe something differently or um, educate him in a different manner. Um, this is information that perhaps doctors don't get right now because they just see someone because they broke their hip, but they don't know that they've fallen maybe six or seven other times and could have prevented it if they had known this. Um, another really important thing is uh, we have to have the mindset where we will support this data sharing and analysis. Um, we have to be willing to share all the information that we have uh, for the benefit of the community, for the benefit of um, our, our well being. Um, a lot of times, uh, just our organizations don't have that mindset. Um, and therefore, we leave that barrier up. Okay, so that was kind of a quick thing of what. Uh, TMI is, but um, I think I, I wanted to focus more on what Utah is doing and then the rural health. So USIS, um, the Utah Statewide Immunization Information System, um, it's something, is what I'm in. It's been, it was established in 1996. Uh, we have over 6 million uh, identities that are in our system. Um, since 2000, we have received over 61 million vaccine records. Um, out of those, a uh, little under 4 million are non-COVID, and that's in the last year. And also, since COVID, we've had 5 million um, come into those, those vaccines. Um, and then within the state, we have three, a little over 3,000 providers enrolled uh, actively um, using the system, providing our information, also pulling information from it. So what are, what are we doing to modernize? Well, for one, we're moving our data to a cloud to help us manage all the information that we have. Um, we are also trying to promote uses amongst the providers in Utah and rural health, in the rural areas and urban areas, trying to get that information out to them, um, as well as Docket, which is an app that currently is being used by four states, uh, Utah, Idaho, New Jersey, and I believe Minnesota. Um, and that is basically a, an app that provides easy and quick access to your health, your electronic um, records uh, as far as your immunizations um, and that information. Um, and a lot of people really like it. I've used it for travel. It's very effective. Um, we have created an admin portal um, for the staff that will cut down on their, on their duties and help them focus, have more time. We are also trying to collaborate with uh, our border states and the federal government to share any data that we have. Um, again, sometimes that's a little difficult just with laws and regulations, but that is something that we're trying to do. And then to move into uh, what we're doing in rural, how our rural state is, have, uh, is doing. Well, for one, out of the 11 hospitals that we have, a lot of them are, are all of them are actually collaborating with us. We have this information for them. Um, from all the vaccines that they've sent us, um, they have, as you can see, been giving us more and more, partly because of um, COVID. A lot of them have sent us a lot of information. Um, each one of them, a little different number, uh, but there are 11 rural hospitals. So some of you may be asking, uh, what is the situation for, that, um, for our rural hospitals? What's it like? Um, we contacted the department 
um, of rural health. We spoke with Elizabeth Craker. Um, if any of you would like information, she would love to talk more about this. Uh, she wasn't, of course, able to, to be here, but um, she gave us a lot of this information. And if anyone has questions at the end of this, um, she would love to talk to you. Um, but one of the things that she's noticed, uh, there's a lot of barriers, and that has to do a lot with work uh, shortages, workforce shortages, and just health insurance claims, getting money back for what they need to, to accomplish. There's just a lot of, uh, of a lack of resource. Um, and a lot of that has to do with just that they're less focused on developing that infrastructure. Again, because they can only handle so much, their mentality is more, we need to build what we, have, what we need at the moment, and we can't really stretch ourselves anymore. Um, telehealth has helped a lot for them. Um, unfortunately, it also increases the dependence on that infrastructure. Uh, meaning that they would need more of this. Um, there is a different population in those urban settings. And so a lot of different um, issues come up, such as transportation, just because of the distance between them. Um, some health literacy, she stated, there's also a stigma associated with these conditions. Um, and a lot of this makes it a little difficult for them. Um, so the impact of DMI for rural health well, it would reduce claim denials. Um, just having this information for them would be able to produce this, um, this information to some of those insurance companies and perhaps give them some of those uh, the money that they would need from all these claims. Um, from what I understand, a lot of them do not receive the, um, the claims um, from what they send. Um, it, you know, if they set up this, uh, this modernization, they can have a dashboard up, they can have drill down reports, notifications that would help them all of those claim denials. Um, it would reduce waste with staffing time resources and also improve staff performance so the real-time monitoring at the resources that they need um, also would help, uh, hopefully also their workforce would be more adequately trained. Um, also, it would better focus on population healthcare needs and it would reduce leakage to other healthcare systems because they'd be able to prevent anything um, just with the data they would have from moving from their, perhaps their healthcare system and having to go somewhere else. A lot of times in rural settings, there's a lack of uh, professionals, perhaps in certain areas, and they need to go to other places. But if they can prevent maybe some of these issues that they have, um, they can prevent them from, from moving or having to look some, elsewhere. So one of the things that Liz told us about was that um, there is a lack of just uh, skills that they have in their workforce. One of these things is, is just analytic producers. A lot of them can work with the data they have, but they can't in more of a reactive manner, but they can't really do more with it. Um, one for lack of time, uh, resources, people, um, and there's just a lack of that and they need that. Um, they focus, and this is a graph she gave us too, they, they focus a lot of their effort on that reactive data. Um, as this graph says, it currently consumes 90% of their time, um, all that effort, um, and they're not getting to that prescriptive area that we'd like to get to. Um, they barely get into the descriptive uh, data. Um, and that is, again, because of that lack of skill and lack of, of people. Um, some of those things that they need, um, like database administrators, data analysts, visualization, visualization developers, data architects, data scientists, that would help them a lot. Uh, right now, they are able to troubleshoot and work with what they have, but uh, in order for them to move into a more modernized uh, position, uh, they need a lot of these people, um, and it's hard for them to get these people out there again, for the reasons I've listed before. Um, but to kind of sum up what has been happening in rural health, there was a um, assessment that's done by Ready Health. Um, they kind of went out through, they visited four different facilities and, and just assessed their situation, what they, how they were doing, what sort of um, experience they were having um, with this modernization. Um, unfortunately, a lot of them are, Again, not, not able to get what they need or uh, proceed moving more, a more modernization route. 
Um, you know, only one of four facilities has a dedicated analytic resource. The rest of them don't. A lot of them leave money on the table, um, but they know that they can improve and, and would like to. Um, and so some of the, rec the recommendations that Ready Health gave was um, to increase data integration, data sharing program. Uh, they wanted to elevate programs that demonstrate how to take action with data within current provider stewardship, augment programs that use data to make care more accessible and effective, and then educate administrators on data security and analytics capability. Um, these are all things where we can improve in our in rural Utah and things that Liz was trying to do. Um, she did want to also wanted me to mention that um, that you know not all is bad. A lot of the uh, CEOs, a lot of the administrative personnel are pushing um, and are really trying to keep uh, their hospitals running and promoting um, just a better hospital around, but it's very difficult for them with lack of personnel and lack of the skills they need. So it's not, you know, there's, there is a lot of good. There's just some of the things that we focus on where we can improve um, in rural health. Um, and that is essentially all I had to say today. Um, so that I will end there. And if there's any questions, um, I'm here to uh, answer them as well as John and Jessica are here with me as well. Gary, can I ask Jesus a quick question? Sure. Jesus, and this is perhaps an unfair self-serving kind of softball question that goes to the issue of, and I think I know the answer to it. Utah, I think is far ahead, but vis-a-vis -vis other similarly situated states, say of the same urban rural mix and the size of Utah, maybe a Minnesota or, you know, or a Oregon or something. Where do you see yourselves in this in this whole process, and do you do you even have the resources to relate to them, you know, outside of like at, uh, meetings of the Association of State and Territorial Health Officers and that kind of thing? And you know, maybe this is more for Liz or John Reed or folks there, but to the extent that you feel comfortable commenting on that, you know, how do we bring everybody along to get them to where you guys are? That is a great question. Thank you, Neil. Um, I would see, I would definitely see what John has to say. Uh, John, are you there? <laughs> yeah, I'm here. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I think, you know, we're, I don't think we're, you know, so far advanced, you know, I mean, I think everyone's kind of trying to do their best. Um, Utah does have a, you know, I mean, they may have some um, uniqueness in our urban and rural settings and especially the, the number, you know, with Intermountain as our largest healthcare provider, we have a lot of small ones, but I think that that does factor into this. Um, the, the biggest thing, and just like Liz found in their assessments, is there has to be the desire by the executives and, and the upper management to implement some kind of, you know, DMI solution. You know, like, like they said, it's, they need to see the value and the benefit before they'll, they'll move forward and invest resources. And so that's really the, the biggest push that we try to give people, you know, is, is get the data out there to the people that can use it. Um, like, like Jesus said, the example of the falls, so we were working with our EMS program and people when they fall, if they call an ambulance and, and, and the ambulance doesn't transport into a hospital, that data never goes anywhere, right? So they could go six or seven times and, and help this person before they actually break a bone and go to the ER. The provider never knew that they failed the six times before. And so we were really trying to say, how can we share this data, you know, from this system over to the system or to the providers that need it so they can actually make a difference? That's, and, and I think that was a real world example where people saw benefit. And so they, they had to change some policies to make that happen, but, you know, but it did happen. Um, and I think we could find other situations similar to that, especially in these rural healthcare centers that we can, you know, help, help push to, to, to make DMI more of a reality. I hope they're, you guys are doing great and I hope they're, you're getting invited to and, and are on many bigger, even bigger forums than this one to talk about where you're at and how we need to get to that, you know, that future that ACES describes. Thanks so much. Yeah, and thank, thank, thanks for having thank, us. Yeah, thank you all your, our speakers today. I want to make sure since this is kind of our last program of the year here, uh, that I, I thank Patricia Gale, who's uh, kind of helped us to orchestrate this, Tracy Morton and Sally Buck, Nicole Clement, et cetera, and I've already thanked Neil. Thank all of you for participating. 
and uh, don't hesitate uh, that the center remains uh, pretty deep in health information technology and telehealth. So if you have questions or anything that TASC can do for you, please don't hesitate to, to contact us. And with that, I'll say good, goodbye to everyone. Thank you, everybody. Please take a few minutes just to answer the post polling yeah. questions on your way out. And uh, echo echoing what Terry said, thank you to everybody who has been part of the National Rural HIT Coalition for the last 16 years, I think is what we have figured out. So yeah, thanks, everybody. Have a good day. Bye. Oh, badger. <laughs> thanks, everyone. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Terry.